let, let's get matters underway. It's my uh, great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Peter Newton. Uh, Peter holds a research appointment in sustainable urbanism at the Institute for Social Research at Swinburne University in Melbourne. Uh, he's the author or editor of more than 20 books on cities, planning and sustainability. He is uh, one of the country's leading uh, researchers and authors on the issues of environmental sustainability in urban contexts in relation to housing. Please make uh, Peter Newton very, very welcome. Thanks, Ian, and uh, it's good to be here to present on uh, uh, a project that we were very pleased to be able to uh, to, to work on. Um, and it effectively uh, is about how to uh, address the challenges of redeveloping housing and associated infrastructure, the combined package at a more appropriate scale uh, in the middle suburbs uh, of Australian cities, looking at a precinct scale. Um, now this is where infill is occurring within the cities, the middle suburbs, but uh, in a fragmented uh, and suboptimal fashion and really not at a scale that will deliver the, uh, the targets that metropolitan planning strategies have for additional net new housing uh, in, into the future. <coughs> uh, effectively, there's no model for redeveloping uh, the middle suburbs uh, at, a, at a precinct scale. There are uh, workable models for green fields and there are workable models for brownfields, precinct redevelopment, but not in the middle suburbs in those areas that I characterise as grey fields, which I'll define a little bit later on. <coughs> So as there are attempts to direct more investment inwards and more population inwards into the established uh, areas where redevelopment, regeneration, the R word, whatever R word you want to, to put, this is where uh, it's happening. And really uh, a different model is being recognised as uh, required in order to drive um, redevelopment, regeneration at a scale which really is necessary if we're going to meet the kind of targets and aspirations that the metro plans have for our cities. And as you can see, there are a range of stakeholders that are involved in this, so it's a very complex uh, arena in which to, uh, to operate. So we're really into uh, aspects of, of transitioning. You know, they're, they're really challenging problems. How do you transition from a situation that we have at the present time to a future uh, situation uh, where there is a lot of, uh, uh, there are a lot of barriers currently preventing uh, transition uh, occurring. And so this is a kind of a transition arena that is being developed by researchers uh, in, in this field. The, uh, the research that we were funded by a hurry to undertake really uh, occupies, sorry, occupies, I'll work out the banners, the first, uh, first two of these. Uh, our focus is on a precinct or neighbourhood scale and we're not really going right through to the point of actually undertaking uh, real world uh, applications. It's more trying to get some ideas to the key uh, areas which require innovation and change uh, so we can begin to progress through that, uh, that system. The methodology uh, is a new one. Um, the investigative panels, those of you who follow Ahuri will be aware of, uh, of this uh, new initiative. And so this was uh, one of the first ones you know, funded under, uh, under that process. It's really designed to bring a range of experts together to represent the stakeholders, uh, to be able to benefit from their uh, range of, uh, of insights to tackle a really challenging uh, practical uh, question. So in this project, we had uh, three panels, over 70 experts involved a lot of mind mapping, uh, e extracting the information, uh, three background research papers, panel reports and a final report. And this is basically uh, how it all worked out with a focus on the middle suburbs of Melbourne, but the results we believe can be extrapolated more broadly across the major uh, metropolitan cities and that'll be a good basis for discussion perhaps after I've made the presentation. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the mind mapping, it's a fairly common way of representing the inputs that come from a range of people who meet to discuss uh, issues. Uh, it's done in real time. Uh, as soon as people make comments, they're put up onto a screen, synthesised, so you get an idea as to uh, wh where people are coming from. So 
just to use this as an example, uh, this is uh, under the question of trying to identify the inhibitors to regeneration of middle suburbs uh, in, our, in our cities. And so you really get a fairly rich, quite a rich uh, set of, uh, of, of information coming out from the experts. The consolidation of sites is a problem, planning's problem, leadership, lack of success stories, financial disincentives, lack of uh, respect for social and cultural heritage, the cost of developing at certain higher scales, NIMBY, existing infrastructure issues, consumer preferences. So it, it really helps a research team begin to frame the range of uh, issues that uh, require uh, deeper attention. I haven't got time to go through all of them <coughs> in detail. They're in the report, which is on the website. So for those of you who want to really de de delve into it, um, this is where you go to find it. Solution pathways, likewise. Um, and as you begin to drill down in particular areas, this was one of the most significant areas of discussion that we had was about developing a narrative as to why it's necessary for metro regions to change in this particular way. Uh, at a macro level, as well as what is the narrative uh, that needs to be understood and uh, embraced by local communities if they want to change, uh, to be partners in change in the areas in which they live and want to continue to live. So, cutting to the conclusion, this was uh, basically um, our summary of, uh, of findings from um, the three panels background research as well as subsequent uh, research. And you can't really pick it up there, but uh, everything below here is where we say new logic innovation is, is required. If you're, able, if, if you're looking to get uh, you know, more substantial, optimal development in the middle suburbs, intensification, as well as renewal of, of housing and infrastructure, more intensification. And so uh, from a governance point of view, new urban policy, redevelopment authority, a regen code um, that's been reinforced in subsequent um, presentations and, and sessions that we've had, new ways of financing um, precinct developments in the middle suburbs, uh, this, the, the, the critical significance of community engagement, the use of uh, uh, brokerage, uh, that's opportunities for local governments or uh, regional authorities, uh, uh, private industries. Uh, the real issue in terms of um, the kind of labour force that's required to deliver um, low-rise, high-density in the middle suburbs, which was basically the target for uh, uh, our, our, our thinking that uh, there are a range of innovations that uh, can be applied in terms of uh, delivering um, low-rise, high-density in the middle suburbs, which uh, could drive down the price points, which are a real problem at the present point in time. And then just where are these greyfield opportunities that uh, we need to identify so we can move forward? So what's the problem? The problem in most of our capital cities are the, uh, the high rates of population uh, growth, um, around 2% per year, which is really providing massive challenges to the state uh, government planning agencies and infrastructure agencies in meeting the housing infrastructure demands that, uh, that, e that exist. And there's no sign that uh, any of the governments are lowering their sights in terms of uh, the, the population uh, targets for the future. So. Uh, uh, higher growth seems to be what we have to be prepared to plan for. So where do you put this growth? Well, um, the greenfields continue to be uh, the areas that uh, are utilised by our, our governments as an escape valve for the pressures that, uh, that, that build up. And so our urban growth boundaries and our wedges continually uh, get, get revised and there are a whole range of issues in terms of the sustainability of, uh, of that particular approach. Uh, into the future with cities that could become five, six, seven uh, million uh, strong. Um, my argument in what I've written about uh, in, in the past, uh, that urban sustainability really comes through having greenfields development, which are a realistic uh, necessity into the future, but uh, not at the scale at which uh, currently occurs, is that, uh, you know, there are 
uh, performance criteria that should be applied to Greenfields precincts development that currently really aren't being applied that could deliver much more significant, uh, more sustainable um, development in the peri-urban region. There are brownfields in our cities which are legitimate targets for redevelopment for housing and mixed use. Uh, there are models for those and also performance criteria. Docklands began that uh, particular trend in terms of the performance criteria that they established for the developments in that area, irrespective of whether you believe Docklands was a, a good outcome or, or not. Um, there was a trend to try and lift the bar in terms of uh, the, the buildings. Uh, the area that I've uh, really focused on has the major challenge is what I call the, the, the grey fields. They're the underperforming residential uh, uh, areas of our middle suburbs. Um, they uh, have the characteristic of being occupied by people uh, compared to the brown fields and, and the green fields and hence the challenges that you have in the regeneration of those areas at uh, some scale beyond uh, fragmented um, uh, redevelopment where Typically, one property is uh, um, sold, knocked down, uh, and developed maybe with two or three townhouses uh, on them. <coughs> and that kind of development, the piecemeal uh, infill, uh, doesn't appear to be uh, able to satisfy the, the targets that uh, all state governments have uh, established for their capital cities in terms of the uh, proportion of housing to come uh, from infill. One of the challenges is uh, the, the zoning uh, of, of areas and the signals that that give, gives uh, to developers. And uh, uh, in Victoria, at least, uh, there's been a lot of uh, inertia in that area. There have been discussions around these zonings now for about four years, and uh, they still haven't been uh, released. Uh, local governments uh, and state governments need to align in identifying the areas that uh, are going to be no-go, in other words, need to be uh, preserved for uh, a number of uh, reasons. Sorry, I seem to be gone too, too tough. Slow-go, where incremental change is, is possible, where neighbourhood character you know, has uh, a place to pay, and, uh, and go-go, areas where substantial change uh, needs to occur and maybe you know, in 10 years' time you wouldn't even recognise the area if you, uh, if you drove, uh, drove through it. Now, um, if you have a look at uh, this, uh, MAVA just uh, continues to reinforce you know, where those new construction is occurring in the outer areas versus uh, compared to the middle uh, suburbs. Uh, the middle suburbs really is where extensions and alterations uh, are occurring. So I guess the challenge that we see is to uh, increase more new construction in, uh, in the middle suburbs. The middle suburbs really uh, have untapped uh, potential and uh, I think if you undertook analyses across all the capital cities you would find similar kinds of, uh, of, of profiles where the housing stock, for example, in the middle suburbs is very much oriented towards uh, detached uh, housing. It's only in the inner areas that you're beginning to get um, uh, higher density housing. Um, employment opportunities uh, uh, also uh, could, could be increased in the uh, middle suburbs, <coughs> even though the middle suburbs are really very accessible to uh, the higher uh, employment nodes that are on either side of them in, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, from a population perspective, the middle suburbs are not taking their uh, share of population uh, growth. <coughs> oh, it's jumped around. Something's missed there, but anyway. Um, so, um, how to uh, begin to undertake higher rates of regeneration in uh, thank you in the middle suburbs? What are the what are the current models? Well, activity centres have been around for uh, a long time, and they constitute um, the the principal focus for um, more intensive uh, development. In the last two or three years. Um, uh, Transport corridor models have been introduced 
by Professor Rob Adams, uh, City of, uh, of Melbourne. And uh, the third model that we're introducing today is in relation to actual housing precincts that exist outside of the activity centres and the transport uh, corridors. Uh, all we see as um, um, necessary in order for the regeneration to, uh, to, to occur. <coughs> Notwithstanding the fact that activity centres have been uh, established for a number of areas in uh, metropolitan uh, strategies, um, when you have a look at what, where the redevelopment is actually occurring within uh, the uh, municipalities of Melbourne, you find that most of the, the redevelopment is occurring in areas that uh, really are outside of the activity centres and away from the transport corridors. In other words, they're in your, in your typical suburbia, but they're all fragmented. <coughs> so we're having uh, fragmented refill, individual properties coming onto the market, knocked down, redevelopment two or three, uh, and we've got the activity centres. We really don't have anything at, a, at scale in between uh, those two. And uh, the reason for that is that there is no effective model that uh, governments and industry uh, have that can reduce the risk and uncertainty that developers face if they want to uh, begin operating at higher levels within these areas. So how do you locate uh, grey fields? Well, the way that we've done that is uh, use GIS. <coughs> and uh, we have um, uh, mapped the ratio of um, uh, land value to um, total property value. Um, so where you get the situation of um, a property where most of the land value is tied up, uh, most of the property value is tied up in the land, you're really operating in, uh, in, in that area. So across Melbourne there are about uh, 300,000 properties where virtually 80% or more of the value of that residential property is in the land rather than the, uh, the residential uh, asset. So from a market perspective, it's suboptimal and uh, really is, is one indicator of many, perhaps the most important initial indicator, to say, well, what, is, what are the distribution of parcels of land that um, fit into that, uh, into that category? So you can map uh, parcels uh, of land right across um, Melbourne, which we're in the process of, uh, of doing now for the CRC for Spatial uh, Information, to identify um, uh, locations where the, the properties, the residential properties, 80% of the value is tied up in the land as distinct from, from the asset, and then begin to get other layers of information that you can bring together to have meetings with developers, local governments and stakeholders to say, well, is there some prospective uh, opportunities in, uh, in particular uh, neighbourhoods? <coughs> what do you do when you've identified those areas? Well, um, you have to convince uh, uh, the players that there is an advantage in operating at the precinct level, uh, and we've demonstrated that in terms of uh, housing benefits, energy benefits, water, waste, health, construction, and sense of place and, uh, and community. <coughs> so when you're dealing with, uh, with, with precincts um, in, a, uh, in a suburban setting, uh, there are options for regeneration if you can consolidate entire uh, na neighbourhoods, uh, maybe where there are some gaps, and uh, are there any advantages if you can, as an individual developer, be able to assemble um, multiple sites within uh, a short space of time to deliver uh, some form of, uh, of benefit in how you can build at lower costs. There have been attempts uh, to consolidate sites uh, in Melbourne. This is, uh, this is one uh, in the Surrey Hills uh, area. Uh, designs were submitted to council, um, not approved, went to VCAT, and VCAT knocked it back in terms of uh, problems with neighbourhood character. Not so much density and design, but this issue of neighbourhood uh, character. So there are major challenges in terms of what you uh, can, can deliver, uh, either in terms of a consolidated site or dispersed sites. Uh, there are many housing typologies that are appropriate to regeneration at this uh, higher scale. And uh, it's a matter of exploring how you can uh, redistribute housing and the various functions uh, if you can consolidate 
the site as distinct from dispersing the, uh, the operations. How you can improve the connectivity uh, that exists in these, uh, these areas. How you can deliver new impro improved energy and water uh, systems, so it's not just, just housing. So the idea is to be able to do some indicative uh, sketch planning uh, that's appropriate to uh, an area as a basis for uh, delivering into those, uh, into those precincts. How do you finance it? The major stumbling block at the present time is the big difference between selling a detached house in a middle suburb and buying into a new uh, medium density uh, uh, dwelling. Uh, you don't have much cash uh, left over in that, tra in that transaction if you want to stay in the area and move to a uh, high, higher density. So um, we've basically identified that there are significant opportunities for more um, <coughs> cost effective or, or savings in construction. There are, there are big differences between uh, you know, higher density uh, construction costs in the middle suburbs uh, compared to uh, the, the outer suburb but attached housing. Why is it so? If you had new manufacturing processes um, and new delivery methods, modular construction, this is beginning to happen, uh, is happening in, in Melbourne, uh, that can provide a new way into the future. And finally, proactive community engagement, uh, the importance of taking engaging the community at the earliest uh, uh, stage, actually before um, the signs come up on the, uh, on the sale signs come up. Um, Identify the areas uh, that are prospective, as I've previously discussed. Begin to engage with the community in terms of their intentions and their aspirations for uh, the future. Um, in the study that uh, we've, the report that we've produced, we, we have indicated that there is a significant demand for living in um, higher density, um, middle suburban uh, locations. So there is a market for, for this area. <coughs> And so there really is a need for uh, new urban uh, policy. Um, I guess what I call, uh, and others call, uh, green urban urbanism. It's distinguished from simple urbanism, which uh, I guess in my terminology would include brownfield redevelopment and fragmented greyfield redevelopment. So this is what's occurring. Uh, there are examples of simple urbanism at the present time. Uh, we're more dominated by green sprawl, but I guess um, uh, our vision for the future is one of green urbanism, uh, where you have both simple urbanism plus green sprawl 